Hello, everybody. I'm Sobin Pin. Welcome to the Khmer Post USA TV. It is the third day that we are covering Terry Sang case, a, a case in Cambodia. She is a Cambodian American civil rights lawyer who has been summoned to court on Thanksgiving Day. I have been talking to her former classmate at Michigan Law School, B Dash, a U.S. constitutional lawyer who offer great insight of what is happening and what this case means. I also talked to her legal counsel, Jared Jenser, who offered great insight about how is this case going and the international community have eyes on Cambodia. So this case will not go lightly. Join me today, Terry Singh herself, will be talking about what is happening. Let's hear from Terry. Hello, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> because I was following all your posts and I looked through them and just like, oh my God, you you have imagined all these scenario and the way you express them is no one else can do it better than you do. Um, it, it's, it, it helps to be on the ground, um, you know, because I breathe these issues and after you breathe these issues, you get to know certain things really well. Um, so in that regard, what um, if I know that a lot of a lot of attention has been focused on me, but you know, my close friends and especially family members are scared to death. And um, I think they're doing better now, but you can imagine how scared they are and they're more scared than I am. So I'm, I'm more worried about them because you know, when you're on the ground, um, I guess it's more scarier. Um, it's more scary from overseas, uh, especially when they know me and I'm a family member. Um, so I really think of them. Um, but you know, I mean, w when when you're in the midst of it, it's um, the the attention and the focus becomes very sharp. So right now for me, it's just no time for all these other sentimental issues with regards to me feeling pity and all that. And I don't have time, I don't have the energy, but thank you so much. And I'm lifted by these words of encouragement because they give me strength, they're fuel um, to know that I don't stand alone. You, I know you see that this is a larger issue than just freeing me because we really don't know each other personally, right? I mean, we, but, um, but you are concerned for the larger issues and you see me as the vehicle for that. And the regime is taking notice of that. And that is the power of standing together, of being united. And um, so I may be the public face, but now so many other individuals and institutions are coming forward because we are all very, um, we are seriously concerned about the conditions of Cambodia and uh, we don't want a repeat of history and the conditions are there that it could happen. We don't want Khmer Rouge to, you know, let's, let's uh, put an end to impunity and um, atrocities and let's build conditions for flourishing. As we speak of this, you spoke so well, so I think we roll right in into the interview. Oh, okay. um, all right. So, <laughs> you are a symbol for those other people already got summoned on the same day that you are appearing so you are a symbol of everyone else not necessarily have means or voice at this time and what do you see is coming is this like a final cleanup or this is just beginning i think you have hit the point that this is they saw it as the final roundup the end of a long line of continual incessant repression so i'm at uh, i'm toward the end of that line because they they this hun san regime um, has been a regime of atrocities of violence um given his past of violence of having been a former khmer rouge commander and then the regional actors and now the superpowers are back into in Cambodia. This regime has been one of atrocities, of um, uh, crimes against uh, its own people. So, but within recent years, within the last three, four years, especially three years when this regime, Hun Sen, banned the opposition party and dissolved the opposition party, it was the death knell of democracy. Um, so, so during those um, uh, months, there were concerted efforts by the government to close down um, the free press, 
we had enjoyed an independent press with the Cambodian Daily, with the Penimping Post, re, um, uh, re, offices of Radio Free Asia and uh, Voice of America in Cambodia, but no longer. And then civil society, civil society, human rights advocates like myself and our institutions have been completely silenced in regard to the institutional platform. For example, they can't silence me individually, but my platform, the organization that I run um, has greatly been weakened. So have other organizations. So you are completely on key and hit the point when, when you say that when um, this is toward the end of a long road of repression. And so they were opportunistic with me. They were calculating with me because they have always been after me, but I always had a very uh, support, a strong support uh, network in terms of very vibrant civil society and um, union leaders and rights leaders who could mobilize. But now look, for example, Rong Chun, he's in prison. He is one of the um, uh, most effective mobilizing leaders and he's detained. The others are either in prison with him or exiled. So with vis-a-vis uh, -vis me, this government, this regime was very calculating, was very opportunistic in inserting my name among the other official members of the CNRP, thinking that I would flee the country. What they did not um, understand and what they could not help um, um, understand and calculated are the support of my friends from around the world, um, like yourself, which we, do, uh, we don't even know each other personally, but you have emerged as one of the forefront um, individuals in mobilizing. And then of course, all my personal friends from, um, from law school days, from university days, and um, throughout the years who have worked with me and who know me, um, this regime, I think, has been greatly surprised by the generous um, financial support I have received, by especially the legal representation. You spoke with Jared. He is the top, he's a top notch superstar human rights lawyer. He's so well known. And so that in itself, my legal representation and his team um, in, uh, in that, that knowledge in itself should send fear in this government, because especially my determination not to stand down and with legal representation. And I'm also aware that I'm very fortunate in comparison to the others on the list. I have dual nationality. I'm also a US citizen. And we know the power of that. We know the power of an American passport. So I'm not um, unaware of this. Um, I'm, and, and also I have networks, I have English skills, and now the resources, the financial resources are there for me to continue um, to mobilize. And um, now more and more friends and um, kindred spirits are, are um, coming to stand united with me in this effort to bring first attention to the human rights violations, serious gross human rights violations in Cambodia consistently throughout the years now concerted. Um, and the dismissal of the rule of law, the fact that the international community had poured billions of dollars into um, the development of Cambodia since the Khmer Rouge, but now we, are, we have reverted to step one again. So they're concerned. So people are coming to my defense, not because of me personally, but because they see um, their contribution to helping raise and mobilize awareness for the larger issue in order for Cambodia to be able to have some moments of peace to build up a society for flourishing. So um, yeah, you are com completely right. Um, it's uh, the end of the line because they thought this would be the last um, sort of nail to the coffin in putting um, democracy and rule of law, law and um, human rights uh, so um, and to death um, to um, uh, put it, um, and I'm one of the last few individuals in country who, who continue to be outspoken. Like I said, the others are either detained in jail or exiled. So I spoke with Jared. It sounds as if they do detain you on Thanksgiving day, this fight will only begin. So oh, we are sure. hopeful. At the same time, we are nervous for you. Um, 
and seeing the clip you cutting your hair on a live TV show, it, um, it, it was that courage. Um, but at the same time, some people have interpreted as you, um, you ready to go. Oh, that was, the, that, was to my, that was my, my um, point in communicating. Um, um, that was the point of cutting my hair was to communicate to this regime that I do not fear them and that I am ready to go to jail. I will not accept any strand of conditions, not even a hair. Um, if I am to be released, it would be to drop all the charges against me unconditionally. So with no conditions, not even a tiny speck. If so, I will continue to push on. And if prison um, awaits me, so be it. Um, so yeah, for sure, it was symbolic, but it was also um, a way to communicate to this regime that I'm ready. I'm, I've, I've been prepared. I've, um, of course, I don't want it. I would rather have um, be outside and have my movement. But you know, the restriction of movement is not, I'm still free. Wherever I am, I will be free. I will be more free than the judges who, um, who will, uh, and the prosecutors who are puppets of this regime. They have to do under fear what this regime has ordered them to do. That's being chained. So they may chain me metaphorically, physically, and detained me with and confined me within the space, but they cannot chain my mind. And it's more debilitating as a human being to have your freedom chained up here um, than to be detained physically. So I understand the inconvenience. I'm, uh, as I said before, I'm under no illusions. I know this regime well. Over the years, I've, I've um, encountered them in various ways, but this is the first time that prison um, looms very, very visible in the horizon, and I'm ready for it. Um, what is the situation in uh, Cambodia right now, the uh, non-governmental agency, the grassroots, uh, in light of um, 68 people, uh, all the CNRP members are summoned to court, um, what the civil society the reaction and 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 people on the street, for example, are people talking? Are people aware? Are people having um, demonstration? Anything that's happening in Cambodia right now? Well, civil society has been silenced, effectively silenced. There are organizations which um, exist institutionally and they continue to do work, but their ability to speak out, to advocate, to mobilize have been diminished considerably. Before at 100% or 90% level when we, and we, we praise civil society for being vibrant, now it's probably at 5% level. But that's not to say there aren't individuals who will speak up and the larger public, they're speaking up. But we also need the inst institutional platform. That, so that is debilitating. Um, and then as I've said, the, um, and, um, oh, and with regards to NGO, NDI, the international NGO, was completely shut down and forced out by this Hun Sen regime. So that's just an example of how um, uh, how blatant this regime has been in combating and attacking human rights and developmental organizations. So they exist, some of them, and but and but that the real human rights, strong human rights organizations we used to know, for example, ad hoc, you know, Tun Sarai's overseas. He hasn't been in Cambodia for years. And ad hoc is one of the more effective ones. So they continue to work, but without the other support structure to multiply their impact. The same with Likado. Um, so they continue to work, but without the strength of before. Effectively, civil society has been silent, especially the human rights community. There's no free press. Radio Free Asia has to broadcast from overseas. Um, but it still has impact. So with regards to me, my case is only recently emerging in the, in the consciousness of the Cambodian public because of Radio Free Asia. Um, but of course, international press, there has been a lot of, of, of attention, um, but it's only within recent hours that um, they are understanding that I'm one of, uh, I'm one of the people on the list and that I'm standing up. And I, I think um, the, the act of hair cutting, I think that was very, it, it moved a lot of people 
to say, wow, you know, because especially as a Cambodian woman, I, lo I like long hair. I love long hair. I don't want it to look like Peter Pan. I feel like I look like Peter Pan right now. <laughs> um, but it's very practical. It's very practical. You know, I keep holding, I keep, because, you know, I've never, I, this is the last time I had hair this short was probably when I was two years old. I've had chin, chin length before, but this is this is boyish, and I'm not into boyish. I like to be a little bit more feminine. <laughs> you look great. You look great. Oh, well, thank you. you. Know, so, I've been following your Facebook posting that you know you also have request Ambassador Murphy to appear on the court day. Are you have you been getting uh, responses? Those individual you. Uh, requested this far what do we what do we know um yes my top request and my top priority and concern is um, uh, for the presence of the u.s ambassador his presence will be so powerful not only um for my protection but to um, but for the protection of the others you know i'm the only u.s citizen who will um, um uh, who are in country on the list so he, um, his presence as a U.S. representative, as a U.S. ambassador um, representing a, um, a U.S. citizen, will speak volumes. You know, um, despite whatever we think of um, uh, President Trump, the U.S. is still a superpower, and um, just his presence representing a the superpower um, uh, of the world will send will speak volumes in terms of. Um, deterrence should anything happen to me or if something were to happen they would have to think again they would have to think twice so that's my first request and my first appeal it's an ongoing situation we don't know whether he will attend so this is why it's really important for Cambodian Americans and for friends who are American to lobby their congressmen to put pressure from Washington to put pressure on uh, Ambassador um, Patrick Murphy so um, I don't know his thinking. I don't know what plans he has for the 26th, but we want to put, we want his boss, ultimately, um, U.S. Secretary of State Pompeo to say, Ambassador, please attend. If we have Pompeo um, giving the order as his boss, as the ambassador's boss, then the situation is, um, is greatly, greatly, um, um, it's a, it would be a great win for our fight for democracy and freedom of expression and human rights. But it's an ongoing uh, lobbying. And so I continue to um, request mass mobilization in terms of calling um, your representatives, um, if you're in the States, to communicate with um, US Secretary Pompeo. For example, Betsy DeVos, and, and DeVos if she can have a private communication with him, mentioning my name, or having even releasing a tweet, we can multiply on that tweet to put pressure from, um, and to have the pressure from Washington be placed on Cambodia directly to the regime and also to lift the spirit of Ambassador Murphy to attend or to heighten his awareness for the need to attend trial on November 26th. So it's an ongoing effort of lobbying. Is your work, the opposition party's work in Cambodia, to this regime, speaking up to Hun Sen's regime, is it something like America, what we, whatever we're doing, Russia don't care? So is it the same way that the opposition party, the, the right activists speaking up to the ruling party, they just don't care, doesn't matter. So that's the question. What do you think of that? You know, every change occurs with one voice and um, accumulating other voices, joining and spirits, um, accumulating similar kindred spirits. Um, of course, they will say they don't care, but if they don't care, they won't need to imprison all the activists. If they don't care, let them and go free. If they don't care, they don't need to exile the opposition members and leadership and ban them. What's the point if they don't care? So the fact that they may say they don't care, but ultimately their actions reflect the immense 
fear and insecurity. We know this. Look at me. I'm, I go about in stilettos and they're going to come. They've, they've assaulted me before. I mean, you know, it's, it's, I guess they're like bullies, but with a little bit more means, right? <laughs> uh, you know, think of a bully in high school or in elementary school. Um, they're, they're insecure. These people are insecure. These kids are in, insecure. They, they want attention. They don't know how to socialize and, and live within the larger humanity. So they always have to sort of like elbow their way, use um, uh, physical violence. Um, so the analogy is not that dissimilar. These, this regime are a bunch of bullies. It's just that they have real means. They have weapons, they have finances to, to um, damage society. But for, uh, for, for those of us, and for many of us who love justice and democracy and human rights and the ability to express our ideas and opinions freely, we know that we may not have the physical weapon, which we don't need and want, but there is power in words, there is power in speaking truth, and these aren't sentiments that are just fluffy. I really believe them. I know many and um, all of you believe them. And so that is, we, we tend to see the immediate and that's what they want to do. They want to instill fear. But bullies, you know, when we stand up to them, they're also cowards. They may continue to hurt us, but if, if there are other, um, for example, I know what they could do to me. I have many friends who have been assassinated, but I want to communicate to them again. They, Mr. Hunsain and his bullies and his cronies, they are not the owner of my life. God is the owner of my life. So if I go with that mentality and I really believe this and I believe in these values, they're my strengths. I'm, I don't have resources in terms of financials. I'm, I'm, I'm poorer than a church mouse physically and, and personally. You know, I mean, I have a lot of powerful and wealthy friends, as, as we can see, and family members. But personally, I'm so poor. I mean, I, I, the, it's, it's difficult to, to, you know, I mean, if I want um, to be wealthy, I wouldn't be in Cambodia. You know, I mean, I would be in Singapore. I would be in the States. I would um, do other things. But so but I'm still standing up to them. And there's, look, it, it has um, ra um, rally an immense support structure from all of you. That's our strength. We may not see it immediately, but we know internally, unconsciously, that's strength, that's power, people power. We got that from the Philippines. Look, they have been able to change regime all over the world. It's the people who, we don't we and they and the regime that I think doesn't have means who change the world through our ideas through our friendships and unity and our solidarity all these values we should not forget history has many examples of changes which have come through nonviolence. Gandhi he took down an empire the British Empire uh, I mean, and look at, I mean, and for, for those of you who, who know um, the history of the Christian church, Paul, he was in prison many, many, many times. And we take comfort from his writings, which um, is the New Testament. And um, Nelson Mandela, again, through nonviolence. I mean, he took down apartheid, which was so repressive in comparison to this regime. This regime is nothing in comparison to apartheid. Years and years of systematic oppression legally, constitutionally, here at least we can use the constitution and this regime can say that it loves freedom and all of that, but all, all verbal rubbish um, because their actions speak otherwise. So we have many examples. Don't, don't be discouraged by, by bullies and by the fact that they, they, and they use threats and intimidation. That is a reflection of weakness, not strength. Strength is good people coming together with ideas and speaking those ideas to change society. It's ideas that change society, not weapons. We see this again and again and again in history. Martin Luther King Jr. He was a nonviolent man who spoke truth, who spoke love, who exude truth, who exude forgiveness. These are 
real strengths. They're not just empty sentiments. And I believe wholeheartedly in them. I'm, I'm not using them so it sounds pretty or is it flowery. I really believe in these values and that there are strengths in themselves. Truth is its own power. I really believe this. I thank you for that. Um, I have another question that someone texted to me asking, what if we have this Cambodian Americans, people who are speaking against him, is he gonna also try to order him up here in his court? Uh, I think you know, people wonder. The power of US citizenship um, is strong. We know that, uh, and I know that, and this is why I'm lobbying friends who are in the US, mentioning and highlighting the fact that I'm an American citizen. Um, it's strategy. And so this government is calculating this, oh, I, I keep saying government, it's a regime. It's not constitutionally a legitimate government. This regime, which is an illegitimate government because it, it um, rewrote the constitution without representation um, from the opposition elected members and, and, and the, the violations of due process are all over the place. But this regime is calculating it goes after low-lying foods, individuals who are more vulnerable, you know, Cambodians who don't have another nationality, Cambodians who don't speak English, who don't have networks, who don't have resources in terms of education, in terms of financial resources, um, who are um, not well known. So some, many people are surprised. Why now? Why are they coming after me now? Because I do have resources in terms of um, and American citizenship, which they know is powerful. They know that. It's calculating and it's opportunistic, as we mentioned before, because they thought that there, I have no more support infrastructure because there's no civil society, there's, there are no leaders who can help to mobilize because they're imprisoned or they're exiled. Um, there's no free press to really help sort of get the message out. Um, they have to be very, t and they're, they're timid. Um, there's no opposition party. So the, the larger infrastructure is not there. And they thought, oh, here's this very vulnerable theory now who, used, who continues to be critical, but she's so vulnerable now, she's all by herself. So this is their thinking. Um, but again, what they didn't know are my friends and individuals like you who are uniting in support in raising awareness. So they're paying a cost. I'm certain that they're regretting that they have put my name on that list and, and they have summoned me. Now, so it's an issue for them. They, I think they're recalculating, they're rethinking my case because maybe a week ago, I would put my chances of being in prison, being detained at 90% or almost 100%, a sure thing. But now, given the, um, the mass mobilization and the, the fact that um, the US, um, um, uh, many um, powerful individuals in terms of friends and representatives are speaking about this, and also um, the, the advocating uh, and my representation by a very famous lawyer, I think they're realizing, um, they're rethinking whether this is worth it because it's a, it's a cost benefit analysis. They're shrewd in that, it's, it's a calculation. You know, before they thought, oh, Terry is an easy case now, um, but now they're realizing, whoa, you know, um, the support structure that we thought she didn't have, it's there and it's coming forth um, in strength. I know you are a big supporter of Sam Ramsey. Um, when I saw that you were willing to face the trial fearlessly, uh, my first instinct was why Renzi didn't do it when he had a chance. Oh, we try. have different roles. For sure, um, undoubtedly, um, I'm a public supporter of Sam Renzi and the leadership, Wong Sukur, um, uh, many others in the leadership. Um, I am, I've always been a very fervent supporter for their policies, for what they do, um, because for me as an outsider, I'm not an official, but I don't hide my open support for, um, for the leadership. I really believe that he is the, um, the, the change that Cambodia needs. 
he has the experience, the, the duration, um, and the, 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 the savviness. I mean, we just, we need more than just one thing. He has a zillion of all these conditions and, and characteristics in a leader for Cambodia that we need, and we need to keep him alive. Um, and so if he's detained, it's, de I mean, his case and my case are not analogous. I mean, I would advocate if, um, for, uh, for his freedom because he needs to be physically movable. I don't need that because we have different roles. So I can raise awareness through my arrest. He will be extremely limited. So each case is different, especially his case. He is unique. It's unfortunate that we are in this situation. It's unfortunate that Cambodia needs to rely on one leader like him. But at this point, I'm sorry, there is really no one comparable to him with regards to all the characteristics that we want in a leader to fight totalitarianism, to, and to fight a regime that is this repressive and who knows Hun Sen well. So not only just head knowledge, not only um, having money, but he has deep, deep experience and he has shown his courage time and again. He, um, he is very savvy in terms of publicity, all those um, factors are very important. They exist in other individuals, but not collectively in one individual like Sam Ransi. And I, 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 as a student of politics, I study international politics and also law, I have two degrees. I, I, I don't give my support sort of blindly, especially if, if my reputation and my, um, uh, my now my security is on the line. But because I believe in democracy and that Cambodia needs democracy for flourishing, I see him as the vehicle. And unfortunately, he is the only vehicle at that top notch leadership to lead the country toward those ideals that I want, freedom, uh, rule of law, democracy, justice, um, and other values that we, 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 uh, we want and know that Cambodia needs right now. Um, so my case and his case are not analogous. He needs to be free physically, um, but I can be tamed and I still can be effective from outside jail, um, inside jail. He needs to be outside and free from the physical confinement. I know that, and like, I know that he would agree like, um, that no one can change and can imprison his, his mind and his ideals, but physically he needs mobility. Um, thank you for answering that. And I know that you were disappointed when he uh, couldn't make a return in 2019, which uh, that's one of the, his accusation because it's linked to Renzi. Um, do you have hope that Renzi still can return at this? Oh, it depends all on our efforts. He needs our mobilization. He needs awareness raising. He, I mean, because he as a representation, he as a symbol of democracy. So when I say he, um, I'm, I'm speaking through the individual Sam Ranzi, but I know I'm not as a personal person, I'm, per I'm not as a private person, but as a symbol, as a representation for democracy. Of course, he will come based on our solidarity and pushing and pressuring um, uh, this regime and our um, uh, representatives to make sure that this regime has a price to, and to pay. This regime will always be calculating, is it worth it to detain someone? And of course, it's a calculation that is a moving target, right? For example, my case has already changed the situation. They, they, it has already changed the calculus for them. Before, as I said, you know, it was 100% detention, is my understanding. And now they're really, I'm certain, regretting. They wish, I mean, ultimately, they would have wished and they would have wanted me to flee. I think that was real, their real intention. But now when I stood up with them, it was full detention. Um, and, but now they're realizing it's costing them. I mean, the public pressure and attention and awareness that is being placed on this regime now, just through my case alone, is costing them. And they chose this, um, you know, it took a while for me to attach, to understand that it was the, the advocacy that I joined in um, asking for safe passage for Sam Ranzi and the other leaders to return to Cambodia to 
do politics in Cambodia to revive the opposition party, which has elected members in the National Assembly to restore democracy. So um, I was advocating for that. But on my summons, I have one page summons and it's full of generalities. I mean, they're, as they didn't attach what is required, which was the referral order by the investigating judge, which would have given details of why I'm charged with conspiracy to treason. Treason is the conspiracy to commit violence, to commit killings. <laughs> I've always been advocating peace all my life. My work has been known for peace, reconciliation, justice. And at every turn, I always say through nonviolent means. So this is ludicrous. Everyone who knows me, and you don't even have to know me, you just have to sort of like cursorily just look at my CV, you, you would get a sense that this is an individual who advocates for peace, for nonviolent change. And then the other is incitement, incitement toward creating social dis, uh, um, chaos, um, public security, impacting public security. Again, for me, it's to incite for flourishing, not incite for the negative. Um, incite for I mean, and, and be involved, get um, and mobilize. If that is what they call incitement, guilty. But if incitement toward violence, not even uh, it's not even in my DNA, not even one strand of my cell um, would ever advocate for violence. Um, because I believe in the power of nonviolence. I'm a, I'm a student of Gandhi. I'm a student of Martin Luther King Jr. I'm a student of Jesus Christ who advocated peace and love and forgiveness for your enemies, for example. So everyone knows that these are bogus charges. Um, it's a show trial. So that's why I had to sort of like play the role and also did the, you know, it's a show trial. So I'm going to sort of act my part in acting. You know, I'm, I'm learning acting now, or I've been, um, um, because it's not based or rooted in justice. It's not based or rooted in law. They wrote the law, but even the, lo the, the laws that they wrote, they don't even comply with them in terms of due process, not giving me the referral order, in terms of charging me without giving me the details. So already there's so many violations. So this is why I don't, I'm not retaining a Cambodian lawyer until my ar arrest. Because if I want deep knowledge, I would want another lawyer to work with me. I'm also a trained lawyer, but we need we have different strengths, right? So for me, because I know it's not a legal issue, ultimately, it's a political issue, I'm going to respond as theater, as political theater. Thus, again, you know, I could have gone very quietly and have my hair cut to prepare for lies and all of that. No, it's a show trial, so I'm going to act and, <laughs> and sort of make fun of this circus and it is a circus a political circus talking about trial we wanted to a vision in our head who going to be there that day is there going to be jury uh will it be attended by jury will there be a judge and who are the judges uh can you so, what do you know at this point there's no jury system it will be attended um, by three judges and two prosecutors. So the prosecutors are the one charging me with these crimes and the judges will decide whether these charges, um, whether I will be found guilty or not um, by, uh, uh, by these charges. And those three judges will decide. Um, the hearing uh, should be... Um, I have the name on the summons. Um, I don't have them offhand. I don't have uh, their names offhand, um, but they're listed in the in the one page summons. Um, legally, the hearing should be open to the public, um, but there have been cases where they have been closed. So we want to advocate for um, the hearings to be open to the public, to the photographers, to the journalists, to uh, witness um, the hearing. I don't know who will show up. We want a lot of people, a lot of supporters to demonstrate, to protest nonviolently, peacefully outside. Um, for me, in my case, it's the first one in, um, of the day. It's at 8.30 in the morning. Um, 
it will be um it won't be thanksgiving yet it will we i'm 12 hours ahead of you and uh on the east coast and i'm 15 hours ahead on the west coast so you will be um you in the united states will um be on the verge of um, a holiday and preparing for thanksgiving busy um so that was why they planned it to be on thursday so that um very little public international American attention can be is placed on the situation. But the other main reason that they chose November 26, in hindsight now I know this to be pretty sure, they chose November 26 because a few days ago on November 16 and November 17, Cambodia was planning to host a very, very high level meeting of state heads of states and foreign ministers from about 70 or 80 countries. So we would have, without COVID-19, this is what we would have seen. We would have seen Hun Sen being the host to all the world leaders, Japan, China, 70 world leaders coming to greet Hun Sen as the host at his um, being um, on his, on, on you know, at and being organizing this grand lavish ceremony and all the foreign ministers would have been there. Television from around the world would be covering it. International television and also television from each country with heads of states, prime, minister, prime ministers and premiers attending this ASEM meeting, A-S-E-M, Asia, Europe, um, high level meeting. Um, and they would have gone home and then all of a sudden Hun Sen could just clamp down on us with these show trials and put us in prison without anyone paying any attention. One, because it's Thanksgiving. Two, because already they're exhausted and they're tired from all the publicity, the, the, um, the you know, the pat on the back I, 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 for Hun Sen for hosting, for being the host. Of course, you can't be mean to the host. You're coming into a, a country as the premier of, um, you know, um, of a European country. You're coming into Cambodia. Even if you don't like the host, you have to be cordial, especially at the high level of diplomacy. So all those images would have shown Hun Sen and his um, cronies smiling, being greeted warmly by world leaders around the world. And then they would go home. They, um, this regime would pat itself on its back on a very high note. And then us, we, the, uh, the ones who have been summoned would be completely forgotten as we stand trial one week later. That is why they chose November 26. It's to be overshadowed by what has been canceled now or postponed, this high level meeting. We don't have the high level meeting because of COVID. So now the calculation for them has already also changed because they were hoping that we would be forgotten by all the publicity that has been sort of channeled on ASEM, high level meeting of prime ministers, premiers and foreign ministers. So generally the calculus has changed already because they don't have that to cover up, um, to, to sort of like dismiss us and, and push us into the background. Now we have emerged and now I have emerged because of all the friends and all the international support which have um, come my way, which they could not have envisioned. I read, uh, we're coming close to the end of our interview, but I wanted to insert a couple more, if you're willing to bear with me. Oh, my uh, pleasure. It's nice talking I, with you. I read some of the comment that you uh, put on Facebook. One of them was, you said Cambodia has two big brothers. Mm. include uh, Vietnam and China. Yes. Can you elaborate on that? Yes. So this regime, in particular Hun Sen, is beholden to Vietnam. So in that regard, Vietnam has been his biggest brother, his, his support, the way that he hugs them, the way that he greets them. You see, and it was Vietnam who basically um, formed him. Hun Sen is formed by Vietnam. 
in his most formative years, Vietnam was his big brother by lavishing praise on him, by giving him all these high positions, by training him, by moving him through the diplomatic world, giving him resources and encouragement. They were grooming him. Um, and of course, him as a very, um, uh, yeah, as a young man, impressionable young man, who just emerged out of the horror of the Khmer Rouge as a Khmer Rouge soldier, and who has just been greatly embraced by all of these well-known Vietnamese leaders. I mean, these are super well-known. They were the ones who were negotiating with Kissinger. So they were internationally known and now embracing this young, skinny boy who was a soldier in the Khmer Rouge and, and saying, oh, you can be the foreign minister. And then after that, the prime minister. So he was groomed by them. And so Vietnam is brother number one. Brother number two came later and that's China. So now China, um, it, he, uh, um, Hun San is also beholden to China. And they have different spheres in Cambodia. So um, Vietnam has always had a very embedded infrastructure in, in, in Cambodian society. They had over 10 years during the occupation to really solidify this structure, the security apparatus, the Inter Ministry of Interior, they groomed and to these days, now they're Cambodian Vietnamese, they have Cambodian nationality, they speak um, Cambodian, but they were groomed and they were embedded as Vietnamese agent in the security apparatus. So the Ministry of Interior was a very, very powerful way because you know that oversees the police and the security and the armed forces and the military, the defense, all those key areas, the Vietnamese embedded themselves. So they're still brother, they're still brother number one. And they're they work behind the scene. They have been effective in calling us racist to block out their crimes and their political underpinnings of Cambodian society. Brother number two is China. So China is aggressive, it's open, uses its big built, you know, with a billion people or over a, a billion now, a billion uh, and 400, uh, I mean, million, uh, a lot of people. It's using its size to sort of not care. They don't need to hide like the Vietnamese. They can be openly aggressive and openly violent and openly be against um, uh, and openly use Cambodia and colonize Cambodia. That's what they're doing now. So for me, the deep concerns are the return to conditions of pre Khmer Rouge, just weeks before the Khmer Rouge, the military buildup currently and also then. The same actors currently the powerful role of China, who, who um, sponsored the Khmer Rouge, the very strong, deeply embedded presence of the Vietnamese, who were also pre and were here pre Khmer Rouge. And really, they were the ones who created the CPP, the Communist Party in Cambodia. The Communist Party emerged from the Vietnamese Communist Party. So all those two main actors are there. And of course, the, militariz the militarization built up and now it has pulled in the United States again. So the three main actors who were here prior to the Khmer Rouge and which led and opened the, um, and the uh, way for the Khmer Rouge to emerge are here again. That is a deep, deep concern, not only for Cambodia and for Cambodians, but regional stability. The region should be concerned that Cambodia and that China is this strongly present in Cambodia. So the presence of Chinese, of China in Cambodia should be a concern to the region because it will create regional instability. And of course it should be a concern to the whole world because China um, being in Cambodia can counterbalance and counteract the US policy and Europe. And as we know, China is everywhere in the world now. Cambodia is an easier place for them to take roots. And strategically, because of our location, China wants to be in Cambodia. It's building military bases inside the, con uh, the uh, country and it's buying up lands across the country. 
So, I mean, when we say co the colonization of Cambodia by China, it's not an understatement. It's a real and present danger. I think one more question and then My I'll pleasure. let you go. Um, we know that Vietnam do not like China. They never got along. They mistrust each other. Uh, but somehow they both want Cambodia. Do, do you see the potential threat that Cambodia might be a battleground? Uh, oh, yeah. Hiding US, siding to Vietnam, Cambo when Cambodia joined in with uh, China. What's the worst possible case can happen here? Yes, so the relationship um, between China and Vietnam have has always been tense. Uh, has all um, the relationship between China and Vietnam has always been incredibly tense um, because they share um, uh, boundaries and their neighbors, and um, historically they never get along. On rare occasions, they will coordinate on the international platform, um, but, but their distrust is always there. And then it spirals down to the tension between Cambodia and Vietnam, again, because over border issues, over issues of sovereignty, and Vietnam believes, and it is the stronger neighbor vis-a-vis -vis Cambodia. And so it just sort of wants to also subsume and colonize Cambodia, and it did that during the military occupation and almost succeeded until the US and Europe came in with the Paris Peace Agreements. So the presence of both Vietnam and China in Cambodia, they have different spheres and they're overlapping spheres, but they're not gonna fight each other openly because China came into Cambodia first and foremost, to counterbalance, to respond to the Vietnamization of Cambodia, to the colonization of Cambodia, to the military occupation of Cambodia. So this is when Vietnam occupied Cambodia, China and the US were on the same side. China, US and ASEAN were on the same side in responding to Vietnam and asking and requesting and advocating for Vietnam to leave Cambodia. And it finally succeeded in the Paris Peace Agreement and also the disintegration of the Soviet Union because the Soviet Union was the patron, um, the patron of Vietnam overseeing Cambodia. So um, all these big brothers, right? And the chain of commands in terms of power politics and, and relationships. So they're not, um, they're not openly conflicting because they have different spheres. They, um, there are some overlapping spheres, but now China um, is the bigger brother, um, but that doesn't mean that Vietnam is no longer here and it's no longer a um, dangerous force for the survival of Cambodia. Both, are um, both China and Vietnam pose existential questions for Cambodia, whether we can survive as a nation. I am not, this is not an understatement. This is, oh, this is not a, a dramatic statement. It's not to um, um, be, um, uh, 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 to, uh, to use hyper hyperbole. This is a tempered assessment from me who studies international politics and who follows this situation very clearly. I am very, very concerned for the existence of Cambodia as a nation because of China and Vietnam and because Hun Sen is so incredibly weak. And if we, uh, if we ought to talk about traitor and treason, he should be charged with treason because treason is to, um, is to sell your, the soul of the nation to foreigners. Uh, as politics changed in la during the Trump administration, uh, the US relationship with China uh, on very bad term and Vietnam have successfully advocated for themselves, the US to be on their side. So to me, when I look for ahead at one point, Cambodia side with China, Vietnam successfully recruited 
bonded, forged relationship with the U.S. Um, this could be deadly for Cambodia, don't you think? It's, it's a very serious um, question of survival for the, the nation of Cambodia. It's an existential question for the country of Cambodia. Um, you have summed it up well. Um, I can't say it in any other terms. It's not to be over dramatic. Um, it's, it's a deep concern. So that looms over the larger, uh, that looms over all these rights violations. So this is why we need to change leadership. Um, uh, we need to change Mr. Hun Sen and get him out of office. I mean, he can't, he and his cronies cannot continue to rule Cambodia in this manner because they're not ruling, they're plundering and they're destroying um, Cambodia. And so this is why I'm, um, I need to continue to join um, uh, everyone who loves Cambodia. And there are many, many of us, the majority of us um, with varying and degrees of, of influence, but all of us have spheres of influence. And for me, I'm focused in multiplying um, the impact of that influence so that it will um, join with other individuals who are lobbying and advocating to have a larger impact in responding to Mr. Hun Sen and his destructive relationships with both Vietnam and China. Um, yeah, so so I agree with you. I mean, the, the, the issues are real for the survival of Cambodia. I'm the in the most beneficial, I, I have with all these benefits, but others are languishing in prison right now without the publicity. I'm very, very fortunate. So I hear the sentiments and I'm, I'm lifted up by these sentiments, but also let not my case overwhelm and overshadow the cases of the others. I literally know that I'm not the only one that there are people right now who are in prison, they're political prisoners who have no voice, who have no advocacy. Let's, let's also be aware and um, think of those who are, who are with less means and less attention focused on, uh, on them and lift them up in prayers and um, somehow we can communicate them. I guess this is maybe my way of communicating and thinking of them. I think of, um, well, Rung Chun is well known, but the other less well known who um, also need encouragement to lift up their spirits because I'm certain they feel extremely vulnerable right now without anyone thinking of them, knowing them that they're inside prison. That must be extremely debilitating mentally. So let's think of them and, and lift them up in our prayers. And it's been really an honor to have this conversation with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the listeners who are um, supporting uh, with sentiments, with comments, raising awareness. I mean, these are the efforts that will help to move change because as you know, it's not just one person, one voice. Um, and it's like I said, it's already changing the calculus for this regime. Thank you for watching our interview with Terry Sang a Cambodian American civil rights lawyer who has been ordered to stand trial in Cambodia on Thanksgiving day for conspiracy of treason. She responded, Prime Minister Hun Sen, he committed treason himself for selling out the soul of Cambodian nation to Vietnam and China. We will be following up the case closely until the trial and after the trial. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Sobin Pin. See you next time.